This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Nate Blyton. And joining us this week is prolific and stylistically diverse composer based in Pittsburgh, Matthew Rosenblum. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here, finally. I, I love your show. Well, thank you so much. Um, so the overall reason for having you here, other than you write nice music and we need you on is you recently completed a recording project with the Boston Modern Orchestra Project, known as BMOP. We found out just from you before the uh, <laughs> the show. Um, it's a uh, what they call a composer centric album, where basically it's an album of all your music and generously made available on SoundCloud right now. Um, I was wondering if you could just tell us about the project and and working with that group. Oh sure. Um... Gil Rose, who is the conductor and artistic director of BMOP, actually has a Pittsburgh connection. He, uh, he went to Carnegie Mellon University, but he also uh, grew up around Pittsburgh. So, you know, he's been back and forth between Boston and Pittsburgh. And I, um, I had this project, well, the Rasher Saxophone Quartet is the other group that's featured uh, in the recording. It's both ensembles. And I had uh, been commissioned by the Rasher Quartet to write a piece called Mobius Loop. Uh, back in uh, 1999, and um, there are two versions of that piece, and the baritone sax player, uh, who I became close friends with, Ken, Ken Kuhn, uh, suggested uh, another project, you know, which would be either a, a duet with uh, percussion and baritone sax. I counter-offered a, a double concerto with percussion, baritone sax, and orchestra, and he agreed, but then we, uh, and we, we involved Lisa Pegger, who's a local uh, percussionist, a wonderful player, now lives in New York, actually, she's in Brooklyn. So I needed an orchestra. Uh, I mean, Mobius Loop had been performed in Europe and so on, but um, for this recording, I wanted to find, uh, you know, more of a local uh, situation. So I met with Gil at a sort of a local uh, drinking hole in town. And I, I uh, pitched Before the all good collaborations start. Absolutely. You know, I figured after a couple of beers, he might be more likely to say yes. So, uh, but, but he loved uh, the idea of, of the Rasher Quartet, uh, which is really um, a premier ensemble. I mean, we have many saxophone quartets. We'll talk a little later about it. But, um, but the Rashers have been around for 40 some odd years. And he just liked the opportunity of... of of having the two ensembles uh, interrelate, interconnect in different ways. So he, he bought the idea, and then it was, you know, uh, we had to get some commissioning money. From Foundation luckily commissioned the double concerto, and we, we uh, performed that. I think it was 2007 we, they played it, and then we recorded it soon after. And we finished it up with a solo, uh, orchestra, just an orchestra piece. So the project, and it was Gil's idea, it was to have uh, two pieces that, Feature just the ensembles alone, just the sax quartet alone and the orchestra alone, and then two pieces where they intermingled in some fashion. So that was the way it, it came about, and it took qu quite a while to get the thing going and find the money and, and put it out, but here we are. It's finally out, and, and I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Nice. So on the actual recording, there is a uh, or orchestra with quartet version and just a quartet version. Um, uh, I was wondering, like, what it was like coming up with the just quartet version. Was it, I mean, did you have to work, was it a lot of reworking, or did it just kind of write itself? Yeah, that's, that's a really good uh, composer question. <laughs> I, yeah, I appreciate that. It was, well, the, the, the concerto came first, and I wrote that. And then the Rashers ask, a lot of times when they commission composers, this is true with the Phil, Phil Glass piece that they commission. And many others, they like uh, they like a quartet version as well as a concerto version. So I wrote for, the concerto first for very practical reasons. Yeah, exactly. Right. So they played the quartet version all over the world. It's been fantastic. I, you know, I've had many performances of it. I'm really thankful. The orchestra version, less so. But but yeah. so the <laughs> truth was, you know, when you boil it down to a quartet format, what do you keep and what do you let go? Because, right. you, you know, it's, it's the orchestra is doing all kinds of stuff. So that was the hardest part. Uh, just, uh, you know, had to, you know, to fit some of the key things that were in the orchestra part, I had to get rid of some of these, you know, sax quartet stuff. So it was this kind of interesting 
back and forth to come up with a solution. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was sort of the process. And I, I came up with something that in the end I was pretty happy with. But um, doesn't give you everything that the orchestra version has. But but it's its, it's, its own piece in that sense. Well, in, in a lot of ways, that's, I think, the, the struggle that we go through any time we write a piece is you know, you, you write the whole thing and then you go through a revision of it and you, you have to part with some things that you thought you really liked and you thought were these really core parts of, of the composition, right? So it's, it's yeah. in that way not terribly different than, than writing a normal piece would, except now you have, in, I think, and this is, I, in, in my experience, the trickiest part of doing that is that you have already conceptualized the work as it is now, and to take things out makes it feel like it's missing something, even though that might actually make it better to someone listening with fresh ears, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there was sort of a double, you know, revision process, so to speak. I mean, with the orchestra version, there were things that, especially with the microtonal types of uh, figures that were in the orchestra, that didn't quite work, you know, after the first performance, uh, there were several levels of revisions. It was pre premiered in Dusseldorf and um, at a great hall. It was the um, the Tonehalle, the Tonehalle in, in Dusseldorf, which is a beautiful place. And and uh, they wanted a bigger piece. I, they wanted the saxophones to be featured a little bit more. So I, I after the premiere, I expanded it. And uh, there's this whole middle section that's really just sort of an extended cadenza for them. Um, so there was that, and then there was the orchestration issues that I had to correct, and then it was the idea of, well, now I've got to write this quartet version, thinking about all those revisions that were already incorporated, and then layering on top of that more revisions. So yeah, there's some stuff that I miss, there's some stuff, but then there's the stuff that, that's new, and in, in you know, that wasn't in the orchestra version. Not a lot, but just in terms of the way it's um, reorchestrated, in a way, um, with saxophones. Um, you know, certain things that were sort of staccato in, in, in the clarinets or, you know, I had all these colors available. I had to then think about, well, how can I get more colors out of just the quartet? Mm -hmm. Sort of reorchestrated uh, some of those, you know, nice moments in, in this new format. So there were different levels of revision, uh, which made the project pretty unique for me. I've never done anything like that. Yeah, it's got a, it's a, like you said, it's a different piece. It's it's based on the same material, but it's definitely a different piece. It's kind of like you know a, a film adaptation of a novel. Like you, it's not going to be exactly the same. It's a different medium. They can't do the same things. Exactly. So, so it's really interesting. I like that. Um, so you is had you worked with saxophonists before? Well, I'm a saxophonist. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's my main instrument. Um, I grew up playing saxophone like since I was eight years old or so, oh, wow. and I went to uh, music and art high school in New York. I was a jazz player. You know, we had our circle of folks at music and art. It's now LaGuardia, you know, High School of the Arts, you know, in Lincoln Center. But before that, there were two separate arts high schools. One was performing arts for the theater and dance folks, and then there was music and art, which was up on 135th Street um, in Harlem. And uh, for the art and music folks, purely music. So we had our group uh, up there and uh, people like David Krakauer and Anthony Coleman, these folks that, you know, we formed our own bands and we played a lot. And I went to New England Conservatory also as a jazz saxophone major. Hmm. But it's more like freer improvisation, things like that. Yeah. But uh, many of us sort of got hooked you know, on the composition program. And uh, that's true of uh, so many folks that started out uh, as performers or improvisers, so we wanted to get it all, you know. So we, uh, so I switched over to composition after a couple of years. But saxophone has been my instrument all along. You know, I, I right now I'm not performing all that much. The only thing I do right now is I play with an Indonesian pop band. Called, awesome. Yeah, yeah, called the Dangdut Cowboys. I play a little curved soprano sax that sort of gets into all these kind of microtonal licks with the singers. Um, that we, we bring in from Indonesia uh, that are amazing. I, this is with uh, my colleague at the University of Pittsburgh where I teach, uh, Andrew Weintraub, who's the Indonesian music specialist and Indonesian pop music's his, you know, he's sort of the expert in this one music called Dangdut. So I, I'm involved in that, and that's sort of my only playing at the moment. I do other little things on the side, but... Um, so, yeah, so... But this piece, Mobius Loop, was the first piece that I actually composed for the saxophone. 
Because I always thought of it, I mean, it's like an improvising thing that I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I just never wrote a piece for saxophone. I'm not quite sure why. But uh, the Rashers called me up and, and, um, and there was this opportunity and I said, well, I'm going to do it. And uh, so that was the first one. And, um, wow. Well, I, I, think what Dave was, I think what Dave was leading to is uh, you write very idiomatically for the saxophone. And I guess there's no mystery why that's the case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, even when, uh, and, and I would like to say, I'm not broaching the subject. He brought it up. Even when writing microtonal uh, passages for the saxophone, um, we were having a geeky composer conversation before the show about your use of, of microtones mm -hmm. and uh, comparing it to some people who it's like, uh, well, the phrase I said was, my music sounds awesome. Here, let me explain the math of my microtonal music. And yours doesn't seem to suggest that. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you got into using that, uh, you know, smaller than a semitone uh, uh, yeah. approach to, to music. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um it's it's been a long process uh, of development, but uh, you know, in my early just sort of saxophone years, people like Ornette Coleman, even the later work of John Coltrane, using you know sort of spectral or notes that weren't quite within the equal tempered. So I mean, you know, right even at that level. But when I was in Boston, uh, came into contact uh, the number of things. I actually took a an intro to ethnomusicology course where my project was Javanese vocal. It was a Javanese vocal music uh, piece. It was a court piece. So I got into transcribing, learning, learning about that tuning system a little bit. Uh, so that was another sort of introduction to that world. Then uh, composer Ezra Sims, who lived in Boston, micro, very hardcore microtonalist, let's put it that way. I, uh, I helped him with his, his teaching one year and got to know him personally. And, you know, so he was, you know, very very interesting uh, influence at that time for me. Later on, um, but I hadn't really started writing microtonal music at that point. I was just sort of absorbing stuff and thinking about things. Um, uh, and then I, I was at Princeton uh, for my graduate work. And instead of getting a TA, teaching assistantship with one of the composers, just like Milton Babbitt or Paul Lansky or whoever, I actually went to the ethnomusicologist and, and worked with him, Harry Powers, who is the expert on mode, was the expert on mode. He's no longer with us. But, and I transcribed Persian music for him. I transcribed um, Javanese music for him. So I was sort of his, you know, his gopher to do all these transcriptions. So I learned about each one of these musics as I was transcribing. You know, this was my job. So that was, and I spent more time in the East Asian library than I did in the uh, music library at the time. I was just very interested in Chinese culture, and I was developing a piece based on ancient Chinese texts. Um, so I was just into this whole Eastern thing, yeah. and, uh, and it really was very influential, but I still hadn't written a piece, but I started a piece called Nu Quan Tzu, which was based on these ancient Chinese texts. Um, in, in the original dialects, I transcribed uh, the sounds of the language, which also was very microtonal. I mean, if you think of Harry Parch, uh, a lot of what he did came out of vocal intoning, so uh, speech, you know, things like that. So, you know, things were starting to come into focus, but, you know, starting to write that music. But, you know, when you're in graduate school, you've got all your professors, like, on your shoulders telling you, you know, you've got to play. And I, I hadn't come into my own language yet. And, mm -hmm. But um, after grad school, I, I moved to uh, the East Village. I lived on 13th Street and 2nd Avenue for all of the 80s, essentially. And that's mm -hmm. when things started to really gel. I mean, I should say that also in... As early as 1974, I heard Lamont Young's well-tuned piano. Mm -hmm. I traveled down from Boston to New York to hear it at the, uh, on Worcester Street, the old DR Foundation. I think it was the, DR, or the Mellos Foundation. So that piece, the well-tuned piano, was a big influence. I heard it in 74. And then when I lived in New York in the 80s, he performed it on Harrison Street at the DR Foundation. For uh, every Sunday for a month, he, it was a five-hour piece with this beautifully tuned piano. Um, that just sort of, you know, that along with what was happening uh, in lower Manhattan in the 80s, I think of Sonic Youth, I think of uh, um, Reese Chatham, and I think of Lamont and, and various people, you know, Bronco, doing things with tunings. And I just, so I actually, this is a little bit of a long story, but I, I went to... Uh, um, 
Bob Bielecki, who was one of the technici technicians that worked with Lamont. And I said, well, look, look, I'm trying to do this. Can you help me? You know, I want you to help me devise a tuning that would work for me. He says, no, I'm not going to help you. He says, what you need to do is buy a tuning wrench and learn the intervals one by one, hear them. And so, you know, that's the only way you're going to learn what you really want. So I did that. I bought a second piano. So I had a baby grand piano in my one tiny little apartment on 13th Street. And I had a, uh, an upright piano. And I, I bought a, the Jorgensen tuning book. And I learned the intervals. I tuned them. I learned how to do this just intonation, finding out. And over about a two-year span, I did want to get rid of the 12 notes. I love the 12 notes that we all, you know, use. Mm -hmm. But I, I layered on top of that... Uh, an added seven notes or an added nine notes on that second piano that were uh, in pure fifths with each other and then had sort of just relation, natural intervals with the notes of the normal 12. So it had this kind of interesting satellite pitches that created this world that really worked for me. I pretty much stuck with that tuning uh, up until recently. I've, I've expanded and I've transposed and I've done other things. But that's sort of the foundation. So it really happened on 13th Street for me and I, I really... I miss the East Village, I have to say. It's sort of like my ancestral home, you know. Yeah, so it's it's not like you were eradicating the equal tempered system and coming up with something new. You were using the notes that individual notes from that system <laughs> suggest in and of themselves, so to speak. Yes, yeah. That's I, cool. I, it's a hybrid tuning that uses the 12 normal equal, t equal tempered notes and then adds satellite notes, so to speak, that have this whole other realm that I could move in and out of. Um, yeah. So it also had a lot to do with the music I was writing, which was playing around with sort of voices or styles. So one could delineate a style with the microtonal world, and then you could go back into another equal tempered world. And you know what I mean? I don't quite do that as much now, but um, it's more blended together. Uh, well, well, Dave and I were listening to uh, Sharpshooter, at, before the show today, which is the first track on the new album, and uh, and we want to ask about that title. But first, we were listening to it, and we were both commenting at how um, oftentimes, if you listen to microtonal music, you're expected to sort of uh, be absorbed into this new system, and it didn't really feel that way. It felt like just a way to get more gut-wrenching sort of, you know, the same thing that Dissonance gives you in the Equal Tempered System. It was just more and different flavors of that inside that instead of something totally new. Yeah, I, 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 I like that description. Um, I, I, others have thought of it as more like also sort of gestural. You know, I use it, you know, as a, as a way to sort of create um, uh, these, delineate these gestures in a certain way. I don't mm -hmm. know. But with that piece, Sharpshooter, uh, I actually used a 19-note equal beating minor third tuning that I found... <laughs> on the web, believe it or not. There's a great <laughs> site called Scala Vista that has thousands of tunings that people just, it's like a repository. So I was just like, That's wonderful. Know, That's hilarious. yeah, it's really I'll cool. Have to bookmark I, just, that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to do on your Sundays, but you know, I browse through Scala Vista sometimes. So oh, I know what it is now. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so I found this tuning that, that really featured this uh, large minor third, it's called five, you know, a six to five interval is what it's called. 316 cents, which I love that interval to begin with, but this is saturated with it. So I said, well, wouldn't it be interesting to sort of capitalize on that sort of bluesy uh, aura, of, uh, but yet with these pure intervals. So Sharpshooter uses that, and it's pretty simple, though. I mean, I really just ask the orchestra members. I mean, I, I have my keyboard, which is a double keyboard. Actually, actually I'll, I'll just go like this, and you can see I've got two <laughs> keyboards, one on top of the other. Yeah. Uh, and when I go through a, you know, I use sampler programs or different sorts of things. You know, the bottom is the equal tempered, the top has the altered pitches. So I usually have that keyboard set up in most of my pieces um, to get the pitches uh, as a reference almost. But so there's that in the orchestra. But then I detune the harp, two notes on the harp, only two notes. I ask the, and then I sort of sprinkle in little altered notes, you know, here and there in the orchestra. And it just, what it did was create this uh, aura. You know, um, just sort of this interesting intervallic aura that went through the piece. You think it's equal tempered, but if you listen closely, it really it's it's phased in a different way. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was shooting for in that piece. 
no pun intended with this. <laughs> yeah, well, it seems like um, a person who's interested in writing uh, in that way has to, um, when we talked about it already, the idea of being practical. Um, you know, if you're only asking the heart disease in a couple of notes, that's your music is a lot more likely to get played than if you're asking some sort of huge re-engineering and special technique development from every person in the orchestra, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I was really scared about the experience with BMOP, you know, because I'm not going to change my language, but I'm going to change it a little bit because you're dealing with an orchestra, you're dealing with a ton of folks, and you don't have a ton of rehearsal time. But I really didn't make too many compromises. I think, the, you know, um, with the, you know it, it worked out pretty well with the rehearsal time we had. You know, other colleagues of mine um, who, you know, have written, you know, more saturated microtonal pieces mm-hmm. for the orchestra with varied success, you know. Um, but, you know, but with me, it's really, it's really sort of just sort of uh, repitching it. So, you know, just sort of changing it slightly to get this effect that I was looking for, at least with that piece. The double concerto, it's a little more of a prevalent, you know, it's really much more of a overtone based spectrally kind of piece that has, you know, uh, serious microtonal moments, so to speak. And Moby Sloop is sort of in in the middle, um, right? So, had you done a lot of microtonal music for a large ensemble before? Um, before th- this project, the largest was about like you know, like chamber orchestra, yeah. it was small, like thirteen instruments, something like that. Um, so, yeah, this was this was the largest. This is the orchestra. Yeah, and like Sam was saying, it's much easier to ask a small chamber ensemble to figure out a tuning system and you're likely to get a lot more rehearsal with them as well. I mean, obviously, BMOP is wonderful, and they're probably as as game to, to trying new tuning systems as, as any ensemble you'll you'll find of their size. Um, but it's still really tricky, and you're still really pushing rehearsal time to, to get people into that, that, uh, that ear space, I guess. Yes, yeah. And as you said, I mean, those folks are as game as any. I mean, there are... They're completely devoted to new music. That's all they do. They're, it's an amazing group. And I, you know, I would pull, you know, I would talk to people on the side, the clarinetist or the horn player or whatever, have a tricky, even the, the pianist, just because it's playing the two pianos, uh, one on top of the other is a little, you know, odd. And try and work individually with them as much as I could. But, uh, but basically, not a lot was needed because they they're very dedicated. I've had some of my best experiences with that sort of stuff with like graduate students, ensembles, young folks that are just up for anything. They haven't been in the real orchestra job where they're just, it's all about getting the equal tempered pitch right on the, right on the money, you know, and nothing else. They were really, so I've had a lot of good experiences with that. Most most recently um, I wrote a piece for the Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble that uh, is pretty saturated microtonally. Also with uh, Lindsay Kesselman was the singer uh, incredible soprano. It was a great experience. Kevin No, uh, the director of that ensemble. I don't know if you know about those folks. They're, yeah. They have summer season in Pittsburgh. Um, Connor Harnick is the pianist. and um, It's just folks from all over the world that they come together uh, to form the Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble. Anyway, uh, having that double keyboard with the notes, with basically all the notes that I, that I want to use... Um, helps because they could just tune to the piano note, you know, the, the altered note. But not all the notes come out of the piano. So, but as a reference, though, it, it really helps. Uh, but I do provide fingerings and, and other types of things. Well, yeah. that was uh, my next geeky composer question. Yeah. Is there a resource you use for um, how to basically like a fingering chart or something for clarinet and saxophone and flute and all these different instruments to do the microtones you need? Yes. So, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of resources out there. Uh, some instruments, for some instruments, there are more resources than others. Flute, clarinet, if you just go online, there are a lot of things. But I have my own charts that I've developed over the years that work for the sort of tunings that I like. Um, but, um, yeah, and there's, and there, you know, like, like uh, you know, Robert Dix, the other flute. You have the basic, you know, the Rayfeld clarinet book. And then many other books as well. There's there's some articles online for the oboe. There's, but when you get string instruments, I mean, in the end, you could give fingerings, but they the performers have to hear the pitches. They have to hear the intervals. They have to understand how how it works musically. Otherwise, it's it's not going to sound right. So because the fingerings aren't going to give you the exact pitch. 
they'll give you a place to start. So oftentimes I look in my parts and they'll cross out my fingerings. They'll put in their own fingering, which is great because they've heard what it should be or they know what the pitch, you know, what the passage requires and they make the adjustments. So, um, you know, I think you have to have faith in the performers and have faith that you're writing something that's going to ring true when it's played right. You know, that's going to sound like something that they know that they need to go for, you know. Um, that's got to be the hardest part is, is, is writing something that when they hit that microtone, that it feels like that's where they're supposed to be and they don't want to slide off of it to the, the nearest equal tempered <laughs> note. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the biggest compliment... I received a great compliment after this experience this summer uh, with the Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble. It was this piece called Falling, which I'd love to talk about. But anyway, the thing was, the flutist, Lindsay Goodman, is a good friend. She's played other pieces of mine that are pretty saturated microtonally. Um, and she said to me, uh, after, you know, we had some Skype things, you know, leading up where she was playing passages. And I said, well, it's not quite that. It's not quite that. It was really a struggle in this particular piece because the parts are really tough. I just didn't hold back because I knew these guys. I knew they could do it. And, and it was a tough rehearsal period as well. But afterwards, after the thing was over and they played it twice, and she said to me, every note was right. Every note you wrote was, was what it should have been. You know, she was really heard the piece. And it was a real struggle getting to that point. But that was like the greatest compliment, knowing that she heard the piece. And when she got it right, she said, yeah, that, that is the right gesture and that's the right inflection for that gesture and you know so that was great uh, you know those are the experiences you, you hope for right yeah yeah have you ever encountered a situation where you wrote a piece that had a high level of microtonal saturation and at the first rehearsal perhaps you go uh oh like i might have <laughs> overstretched my requirements uh no i haven't had that <laughs> that's good Good. No. Okay. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> Flat out. <laughs> Perfect. Um, because, well, the reason I ask is uh, I actually attended a master class years ago during my undergrad with Ezra Sims, and I'm actually the proud owner of two photocopies of handwritten Ezra signed handwritten scores of Ezra Sims, and his music is very, very <laughs> saturated microtonally, and we talked a lot about the rehearsal process and trying to get people to hear his music in a certain way. And he he had he talked quite a bit about the difficulties of getting people to do it. And I think if I'm if I'm correct, I think his music is a bit more saturated microtonally than yours seems to be typically. Yes, yes. You know, Ezra uses a, a basic 70, 72 note uh, grid. Yeah. But he never uses all the seventy two note to an octave. Seventy two notes. You know. Right. The octave. He uses you know twenty four note or eighteen note scales within that seventy two. But yes, no, he's very demanding, and I mean, I, I love Ezra, we, we go back a long time, but we've had a lot of uh, sharp email exchanges, you know, criticisms of my thing. I, I don't dare criticize his thing, because I, I love his thing, but, but in terms of the relationship with performers, yeah, I mean, it's very demanding. But he has a, a core group of people in Boston, certainly, that know his music, have played it for a long time, and really nail, nail it, you know, get it just right. But he had a, a piece also performed by Beamop that was, you know, very um, saturated, as we're saying, microtonally. And I think it was, it was quite a challenge, but, but it's out on a recording and it's, it sounds great. So it can be done, but, but it takes a lot. It takes a lot of commitment. Right. Um, so in addition to this project that you, re that you completed over the summer with BMOP, um, you have, I think it's a yearly recurring thing uh, that you're in partnership with, a, with uh, Eric Moe. Yes. Uh, called Music on the Edge. Could That's right. Could you just tell us about that? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, Eric, um, Eric Moe is, is my co-director. You know, he, st he founded the series in uh, 1990. So this is actually our 23rd uh, season. Uh, which is amazing. Uh, we we present uh, you know five or six concerts a year. We you know we present ensembles. We also we also have a resident chamber orchestra that occasionally uh, we had Ursula Oppens come out to perform the Ligeti Piano Concerto with our resident chamber orchestra. Roger Zahab uh, conducted that. It was a brilliant concert. It was a 80th birthday concert. But generally, you know, we bring composers. We bring ensembles. We we've had we've had pretty much. Everybody out, third coast percussion, ice, counter induction, California ear unit with Louis Andreessen, we have Chen Yi, we've had, you know, 
over the years, we've basically had just about everyone out here. And uh, we, we even brought the Harry Parch instruments two years ago uh, with Dean Drummond, uh, who passed away this past, you know, this past spring, unfortunately. But he came out uh, with, uh, you know, 24-wheeler truck with all the Parch instruments. Uh, we had a sold-out event. You know, people came from all over the place to hear this thing. It was a great concert. So, uh, yeah, we've been doing it for quite a while. Um, this year we have, we're closing with the Jack Quartet. It's our second time we've had them. Uh, the H2 saxophone ensemble. We uh, this is this season, and uh, we had either or with ensemble son from uh, Sweden ensemble. So they were doing this tour with a both ensembles, a double quartet um, uh, commissioned all these you know some composers from Sweden, some composers from, from the United States, including Zena Parkins and uh, Richard Carrick had a, had a, a premiere as well. So that was our first concert uh, this year, and we have uh, Strike Duo. And um, what am I missing? Oh, a concert this year is very close to my heart is the music of Bur van Nostrand, who's a very a little known composer um, who uh, hasn't written for quite a number of years, but they just put a new recording out on New World Records. There's been a renewed interest in this sort of groundbreaking uh, music that he wrote in the 70s. So we're bringing Burr out. He lives in New Haven. He's one of my first composition teachers is Burr van Nostrand. And... Um, I just, uh, I'm a huge fan of his music. So it's going to be, it's very demanding. It's all texture, it's all sound, extended techniques, but very unique uh, and very original music that, that he produced. So uh, we're really looking forward to that concert. Uh, Dave Edgar will be the cellist. Eric's playing piano. Lindsay Goodman's the flutist for his trio that's on the New World Record. And Anthony Coleman's coming down with the New England Conservatory uh, Ensemble to play this epic piece called Voyage in a White Building, which uses, it's all graphic notation. I mean, Burr's notation is extraordinary. It's, it's just, you know, you could, you could frame it, and, but it's very detailed graphic notation. So um, they, they recorded it for the record as well, and so we're featuring that group on this concert, and that's in uh, February 22nd. It's so come on out. <laughs> we'll have a link to the uh, page detailing the upcoming events on our show notes. Um, so, Matthew, what are you working on right now, or what, what big do you have in the hopper coming up? Yeah, um, well, there are two things um, that I'm working on. Uh, one is a clarinet and orchestra piece written for David Krakauer, <sighs> and also a BMOP. So, it's, uh, it's called Lament slash Witches Sabbath, based on somewhat appropriating some elements of the Berlioz, you know, the last movement of Symphony Fantastique just in a very vague way, but sort of meshing my microtonal language with, with David's klezmer improvisatory sensibilities. You know, so we, we have to find an interesting middle ground, and I look forward to working with him on that. And, yeah. If there's anyone I would trust to being able to play any microtone you could ask for, it would be David Krakauer. Absolutely. I mean, I mean my wife and I are both huge fans of his playing. Yeah, yeah, I am too. And uh, he's, of course, played on our series uh, a while ago and did the uh, Gully Hub Dreams and Prayers with a yeah. local string quartet. That was just incredible. Um, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. The other big project is a double quartet for flux and mantra percussion that, um, that I'm also really looking forward to. It's going to hopefully go in a slightly different direction. Uh, than the stuff I've been doing uh, up to this point. So, so yeah, uh, those are the, the two big things. Um, with the Flux Mantra piece, it's, it's sort of leading towards a, a festival, an alternate tuning festival that I want to do in Pittsburgh a little more than a year from now. Mm-hmm. So I'm starting to think about what that'll be, who to bring out, you know, how, to, how to sort of focus it. But um, I should say that Music on the Edge, uh, we also partner with the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. So half of our concerts are done at the Andy Warhol Museum. Ben Harrison, who is the, uh, he's the director of performance there, uh, we have a great relationship with them. And, and our first concert there, which was, I think, about three years ago, was the Sirius String Quartet and Elliot Sharp. And uh, we had to turn people away. It was just an incredible event. So it started this great relationship with the uh, Andy Warhol Museum. So that's a great venue, and we're really sort of lucky to, to have them as a partner. Yeah. 
Um, Not often that you have to turn people away from contemporary chamber music performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a small venue. It's, it's yeah. 135 folks. It's in the theater where they show the Warhol movies, actually. So it's like a cool. little screening room. But over the years, it's become more sound uh, friendly. That's so, right. Yeah, it's cool. Very nice. Um, before we forget, since I brought this up earlier, and I still want to know, uh, tell us about the title for the track, first track on the new album, Sharpshooter. From whence comes this sharpshooter title? Ah, uh, okay. Well, sharpshooter uh, is sort of a sec. It's, it's a take on an earlier piece. There's a piece uh, that I, it was called "Fantasy for Roberta Liss," my uh, my cousin Roberta, and for viola, um, percussion, and piano. This is uh, a different take on similar material, but it has very uh, it's very rhythmic. Has very pointed attacks. There's muted piano notes that have a very sharp attack. And it's just sort of very singular in its uh, approach to the material. You know, it's, it's, it seems to, you know, have a, a reduced amount of material and, and very sort of straightforward. So, I don't know, it just sort of captured, uh, to me, the, the sound of the piece, mostly rhythmically, I guess. Yeah. That's kind of the impression I got from listening to it, actually. So, good. Very, very good work, sir. Thank you. <laughs> so, are we moving on to the news Let's now? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Well, uh, we've talked, we've mentioned some uh, Medici TV performances before, and we've we also talked about um, the the mounting of Stockhausen's Gruppen that uh, the New York Philharmonic undertook this past summer, and uh, it was recorded and broadcast uh, by Medici TV, which is a, a wonderful kind of PBS arts type internet thing. They stream really high quality video and audio of performances, not just music performances, but from all over the world, festivals and things, which is wonderful because I live in Orlando and there's nothing but, you know, McDonald's here. And uh, it's nice to be able to, to see some of these performances. They are coming back around and as, as part of a, a, I believe it's like a week long celebration of the New York Philharmonic uh, this this week. Uh or the the I Love New York Philharmonic Festival, uh, yeah. so you can you can catch it again now. Uh, the performance of Gruppen, which is wonderful because it's the kind of work that only gets mounted once every like twenty or thirty years anywhere in the world. So uh, definitely check it out, and we'll have a link in our show notes. There's um, some Boulez on there. There's also some Mozart, and the unanswered question version of the unanswered question that's on there is very nice too. Sure. The only and it's streaming for free ninety nine right now on their site. Um, the only problem That's is that free to normal people. <laughs> yes. It will ask you every four or five minutes to sign up and donate or something like that. So you should do that. So they can keep bringing you Stockhausen and they know then that the people that like the Stockhausen are the ones paying the bills. So they should do more of that stuff. Right. <laughs> um, just a do, quick do, before mention. Before we move on, Matthew, do you do any kind of like video documentation of, of your shows? Um, yeah, I mean, some of the shows, yes, we we do um, some video documentation, not not a lot. Um, we're mm. just really catching up on the audio documentation to tell you the truth. Sure. Get in an archive, but um, that's that's something we really need to do more of. Um, it's it's great for for people like I said, like me, or for even people that live in the area. It's this great thing that is ephemeral, and it would be nice to experience it in the future. I would pay some money to watch a, a live stream of Music on the Edge. Totally. I've, oh, that's great. You keep that in mind. I will keep that in mind. Um, yeah, that's that's a great idea. There are some some pay per view, do it yourself pay per view solutions out there. Just just yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. Sam, what were um, you going to say? We mentioned it uh, last week, but t- happening today, as a matter of fact, is the uh, M- uh, MTV the uh, the YouTube YouTube Music Awards. Um, just, and you know, this is interesting for a lot of reasons. It's just that it's a place where anyone, you know, what does the fox say can compete with? Rihanna or whoever, sort of on an equal playing field yeah. in this venue, which that's the most interesting thing to me. Well, that's uh, been changing sh- all year. Earlier this year, in February, Billboard started counting YouTube video plays toward the 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 Billboard charts, and that's that's right. how Ilvis the Fox got on the top ten <laughs> Billboard chart because every it blew up on YouTube. That's right. And, you know, this doesn't the, – the music awards themselves don't directly relate to new music in the terms that we're talking about. But, you know, uh, as an example, I mean, 
YouTube does have something to do with new music because if you uh, alarm will sound has tons of videos. Um, it's a great place to go and find music, and people are using it more and more as a way to, to get the word out for themselves. Um, it's interesting the categories they have too. They have uh, they have most of the normal categories plus a few YouTube. They have categories. artist of the year, video of the year, which are obvious. Then innovation of the year, mm-hmm. which is interesting. And watch and response of the year. This is interesting. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Like, so in other words, something that was a response to something else, which is basically embracing the idea of this being a communication medium, a back and forth rather than a one directional medium. And that's one of the categories, which is really interesting. Uh, breakthrough, uh, YouTube phenomenon, which is kind of like, you know, what like new best new artist. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it's interesting and I'm sure we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll say something briefly next week on how that sure. turns out and who wins what. Yeah. And it, it underscores how YouTube has become a, a, a really important channel and dis- distribution channel for, for music in general. And, 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 you know, our, the kind of music that we're into is, is a part of that as well. It's, it's mm-hmm. not just the Fox and, yeah. uh, Gangnam style. Right, right. So if I can just interject for a minute. Yeah, please. You know, these two ideas about the group group and I, you know, sort of uh, being able to broadcast that or in some fashion and also uh, even on, on the air, like the BBC radio, different things that we can tune into things that are going on live. I know um, and the Philadelphia Orchestra, I know, had the sort of closed circuit TV thing they were trying to push. Uh, of course, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, you know, it, we didn't buy it because we have our own great orchestra, but... Um, they tried to, you know, sell this idea to, to universities and so on. Um, it was very interesting. So I wonder if, you know, with YouTube, I mean, you don't see a lot of orchestras, uh, you know, really videotaping their stuff and posting it anywhere. I mean, probably all these union problems. Right. I'm not sure exactly. But um, one thing I wanted to mention, I mean, it's, it's a great way to promote your local orchestra or whatever. The Pittsburgh Symphony this year, uh, I don't know if you heard about this, they usually have a composer of the year, one composer, whether it's Chris Rouse or John Adams. They've had all basically, you know, uh, Mason Bates last year. They've chosen uh, eight Pittsburgh composers as the composers of the year. I'm, I'm lucky to be one of them. And, uh, and it's just um, so they commissioned four, uh, five of us to write a piece. So it's just really unheard of for a local, for, you know, my hometown orchestra to commission local composers like that, and they're featuring eight composers. Um, so it's, it's, it's something that more orchestras should do. But just imagine if they were to post that on YouTube. You know, that would be yeah. a fantastic way to not only promote local Pittsburgh composers, but just the orchestra in general and show what they were doing. I have to talk to Bob Moyer about that, who's uh, yeah. this record. I, but, well, I think yeah. you're right. It's the, the union C- and CBA rules about re- reuse and residuals and all that stuff can get really crazy and, and potentially expensive for the orchestras. And that's, I think, one of the reasons that that, that we haven't seen it take off the way, it, and, and it really has for chamber music. Yeah. You can find all kinds of great chamber music performances right. on YouTube, but unfortunately, the, the CBAs are tricky, and the they're negotiated based on, you know, things that have the industry norms for the last 50, 60, 80 years. Right. And they don't include anything like YouTube. So, right. yeah. And when you consider how a younger, you know, getting younger people interested is the catchphrase that everybody, every orchestra is talking about. How do we get new audience members and younger audience members? And this is so directly connected to the modes of discovery of younger audience that, it right. seems like a no-brainer if they could just get past all the legal mumbo jumbo to get it to happen. Right, right, right. right. Um, Speaking of you know, orchestras, yeah, you know, if I were going to come up with a name, if you were going to make jokes about how young some new music director at an orchestra is, you know what a clever name to give him would be? What's that? Teddy. Man? Wouldn't that be the perfect name for some really young guy who is the music director? Yeah, <laughs> this we should we should just the next time somebody hires like a say like a 26 year old music director they should just rename him teddy yeah well as a matter of fact or you can skip that step the louisville orchestra has hired uh the uh the former uh assistant conductor from detroit um teddy abrams i think i got that right didn't i Yep. teddy abrams he's 26 he's signed a three-year contract 
with the Louisville Orchestra, and you know they just finished. Uh, they just came out of chapter. Are they out of chapter eleven now? Uh, I don't. I think they're still. It was three years ago still. that they filed chapter eleven. Well, I, I'm not sure actually. Then. Well, anyway, so they've had troubles, and uh, one of the things that that uh, Maestro Abrams himself said is that he's going to take the things he learned from being involved in sort of the kerfuffle in. Uh, Detroit, which is sort of the, like the beginning of all the labor disputes that we've seen recently in uh, major orchestras. He's going to take that knowledge and that experience with him to Louisville. So hopefully it'll be smooth sailing for Louisville for a while, for at least three years, hopefully, because his tra- contract is for three years. And uh, that's, you know, Dave's, that's uh, near Dave's, it's not Dave's hometown, is it, Dave? What? Louisville is not your hometown, is it? No, I'm from St. Louis. Louis yeah. That's right. It has Lewis in the name, so yeah. you're close. <laughs> so anyway, uh, no, that's curious. very exciting, and 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 you know we we talk about using YouTube to bring new audiences, younger audiences in. I think it's great that if a young audience, a young younger audience does start coming to these concerts, they'll see somebody on stage that is seemingly more relatable to them, mm-hmm. right? So that's I think this is great, and and you know move over Gustavo Dudamel. There's a new hot young conductor in town that's right and by in town i mean halfway across the country (laughs) you you know what else is very relatable to young young people lower Uh, prices blue plate specials (laughs) yeah right (laughs) that's right so we had uh uh oh i forgot his name mark ostro mark Mark ostro founder of score street was our guest on the show a couple of months ago and score street if you recall is a new publishing and distribution platform scorestreet.net um, and last week we had Frank O'Terry on the show, and Frank was one of the uh, the the early adopters uh, at Score Street, and kind of an advisor. And they're, so they're a platform for selling digital copies of your music, selling physical copies of your music. They take care of the printing and uh, delivery and everything, which is a, a big issue if this is something you're interested in. And one of our criticisms of, of the, the platform and one of the criticisms that seemed to, seemed to be shared by a lot of other people was that it was very expensive. Um, they, they take a, a $30 a month uh, to post your, your bio and picture and put your scores up and all that stuff. Um, and it seemed like a lot for something that wasn't necessarily going to turn around and, and get anything back. If, if you flopped or people weren't interested in the stuff that you were selling or nobody happened to f- find Score Street that was interested in buying your scores, then you were just out the, the 30 bucks, and that, that seemed like a lot to us to take a flyer on. Um, yeah, there, there wasn't a dipping your toe in price. There was you know? a 30-day free trial, to be fair. Yeah. There was a 30-day free trial, but... Um, Score Street has heard those criticisms and is now releasing a new tiered pricing structure. Plans now start at nine ninety five, so a little more enticing to check out. Um, so I think that they are trying a really interesting new thing. I'm still not sure that it's exactly something that I'm interested in participating in, but I think it's much more appealing now to give it a shot. So. Um, take that for what it is. This is not an ad. We're not affiliated with them, but uh, they they did change their pricing structure, and it was something that we had um, criticized them for on the show previously. So we wanted to make sure that um, we updated you on on that story. Dave, did they have further the Bolton's publisher events warrant? Did they have the publisher category before? I don't know if they had that, but that's true. They have so they have now the ten dollar one, the twenty dollar one, the thirty dollar one, which is pretty much the same as it was before. Now they have a big, really expensive one for publishers. Seven hundred and fifty titles. Yeah, so you can have a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of different composers. It's kind of an interesting oh. idea that you could set up your own publishing house and have this this entity doing a lot of that extra marketing stuff for a group of composers. So, I mean, that's, it's an interesting project as well. And other people could build businesses on that. Yeah. Yes. Perhaps we should resurrect the folio publishing company and get <laughs> right. a license. Yeah. yeah. There you go. It's only $500 a month. So we could, right, we yeah. could totally do that. Yeah. Yeah. So score street, making some changes. Uh, another news story, uh, regarding orchestras is Valerie Gergiev has been getting a lot of attention from people that are not wild about Valery Gergiev uh, over the last few weeks. 
Uh, he has been giving performances all over the world as he he, he conducts like two hundred something concerts a year. He, he's conducting almost every night of the year. I think he 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 takes like every other Tuesday off or something. Um, but he uh, has been the on the receiving end of protests regarding his uh, support of Russian President Vladimir Putin, uh, who is, is, if you follow the news at all, you may know, has uh, been championing a lot of uh, anti-gay laws in Russia over the last couple of months. And there have been a lot of issues regarding the upcoming uh, Sochi Olympics. And um, Gergiev has even, you know, done campaign ads and things for for Vladimir Putin. He's it's weird for us to think of this in the United States where nobody outside of our relatively insular community knows orchestra conductors, but uh he's one of the most popular celebrities in Russia. Uh he's the the artistic director at the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg. Um he's also the principal conductor of the London Symphony. Um, which is one of the his main performance uh, venues in the West. And at a concert on Friday, as we're recording this, um, there was a, 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 a protest on the stage. Somehow, uh, gay rights activist Peter Thatchell got past the Barbican security guards and stood up on stage and gave a, a speech to the audience before the show started, which is kind of astonishing. Um and timed perfectly, as usual, is Alex Ross's piece, which comes out in The New Yorker tomorrow as we record this. The no- November 4th New Yorker has uh, a story about protests against Valerie Gergiev. So um, I don't know if there's a lot to say about that, uh, but I think it's really interesting that orchestras and conductors are uh, being a, a point of political concern in the West and and other countries, it's as as problematic as Gergiev and his political views are. I think it is nice to know that people see the orchestra as uh, a, a vehicle for social change and relevant enough to be worth protesting. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. right? Yeah. So uh, that's that's that uh, that's that. I don't really have anything else to say about that. It's interesting that the person uh, – this is an article in The Guardian, and the person says that uh, it was not disruptive, and it was, wasn't was being disruptive just for the sake of being disruptive the way some protests are where somebody's standing up and screaming and has a T-shirt with an, a, some sort of a catchphrase on it. It was a, a rehearsed and calmly delivered speech, which is actually a better way to go than just trying to make a bunch of noise and right. Right. and have a video of yourself getting drug out by security, you know. So, so this was a an audience member that just sort of made their this way up to guy, the guy. I don't know if he was planning to go to the show, but he's not a person that works at the Barbican or is associated with the orchestra, as far as I know. He's just a guy that somehow slips past security. Wow, that's that's very interesting to hear about that. I hadn't, I hadn't heard that. that yeah, well, it just it just happened right. on Friday, so um, it's it's and it's weird. Apparently, uh, the the. The I believe it was the Guardian review that I was reading of the concert yeah. that mentioned that they they thought that um, it didn't really have a, a much of an impact on the show. Mm-hmm. Peter but. Tatchell he has his own website. It says Human Rights, Democracy, Global Justice, and LGBT LGBTI Freedom. Mm. So anyway, really interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering, Matthew, if you have done much um, electroacoustic music. In your days as a composer, yes, um, sure, yeah, I, I um, many pieces, but uh, it's it's usually dealing with text or sort of ambient sounds that are or found sounds. Um, this piece that I just did with the uh, with the Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble, it's based on a James Dickey poem called "Falling," about a about an actually a National New York Times article about a stewardess that fell out of an airplane. Oh, wow. And they discovered her, you know, in the fields. Uh, it was over Connecticut, but this was in the late '60s. And uh, I'm going to get to your question, but and James <laughs> Dickey, uh, uh, you know, sort of did this uh, reimagining of it over Kansas, and it was a much longer drop. But it was all about this sort of psychedelic, uh, kaleidoscopic, you know, psychological states that she was going through. It's very yes. re- life affirming, and is you know, but. 
in that piece, I used uh, filtered wind sounds. I used some earcom technology where I, I, I started out with this uh, huge, you know, very harsh wind. Actually, took from a uh, from a skydiving video. But anyway, <laughs> and uh, very just sort of, but it gradually filters into sort of a microtonally uh, pitch, you know, strands of pitch that. So you know, I use technology in that way, but there's also uh, a lot of text stuff that I do, um, and of course there's the keyboard thing, which it's not a lot of fancy stuff other than tunings uh, through samplers and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, over the years I've done various things, not so much um, interactive uh, in that way. It's more fixed media types of electronics. Right. Well, archiving something like that is far easier than stuff that has you know interactive elements. <laughs> Um, new piece by a uh, friend of the show, Alexander Gardner, this week on New Music Box actually just sort of raises the question of archiving uh, electroacoustic music and pieces that either, uh, uh, as an example, older pieces that were written in the 70s and 80s that use ele have electronic components that are like hardware pieces that haven't been manufactured in decades. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and basically but just still raising great pieces the pieces worth preserving. Mm -hmm. Right just raises the question both of how do we go about um, archiving these pieces and and sort of uh, tangentially suggesting the idea of is the idea of canonized music as big a deal and as important now more generally than, you know, in the past. Right. Uh, is that something that ever concerns you with your electronic music? Yeah, well, I think there are a couple of issues here. One is uh, just sort of the you know, legacy equipment, you know, or, or right. whatever it might be. And it seems like over the years, they've done a fairly, the tech folks have done a fairly good job of re-envisioning, you know, the old technology, whether it's the old DX7 or the, you know, different right. things that came along. And, you know, like someone like John Adams has a lot of old patches, if you look on his website, but they've sort of, you know, reconfigured them. And I run into that with old samples and things that I've done. Um, so it's, it's a matter of just sort of, uh, I, I mean, I do that myself. So just translating them into the new software and trying to find ways to do that. But wh what do you mean by, by archiving or what is the document? What's the musical document? More and more, it's the recording, right? It's, it's, it's the perform or the, you know, that's, that's the musical document. Um, it's certainly true with improvisation, right? But it seems like more and more with, with, with new music and like with electronics, a lot of times it's, it's that soup. Composer supervised recording, you know. Yes, will people want to recreate that? Sure. And that's where this whole legacy, you know, how do you translate that? You know, 20 years from now, what are they going to be using? Well, Max, you know, can Max MSB can pretty much emulate any of these old, you know, any, any of this old technology. It seems to me. I'm not an expert. But mm -hmm. people have been thinking about it and working on it. So, um, well, well, in, actually, in this essay, actually, um, Alex mentions that uh, she mentions a, a project by clarinetist David Wetzel to reconstruct Thea Musgrave's Narcissus, uh, which is a, a hardware based piece with, uh, I guess it's, it's de delay, right? Yeah, it uses an old, old hardware delay machine with a mic feeding into it and a couple foot switches. And it's like, it's a, it's a piece of gear that um, you wouldn't really find anywhere. And I, I, I've never heard of anybody having one. Right. But this, this piece, uh, I've, I, I've done an adaptation of this piece for PD and I've met a couple other people that do different things with even other pieces of hardware or something. And so, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Um, in this article on the music box that uh, Alexandra Gardner wrote, uh, you can. She's got a link to the guy's uh, abstract for his dissertation that Which he is did. Just about on. this reconstruction in yeah. Max. But, and it's interesting to read um, the whole the whole project of uh, like hardware changing, software changing, and having to continually update. I wish that I remembered the the name of this uh, composer, but I I don't. I'm gonna have to look it up. But um, I remember learning about in school a composer who had written a score for a con entirely electronic work, but that had to be realized by the performer. And um, without it was any, up to you to figure out how to do it. Exactly right. Gave Which indication of what mm. what like technically the things, the different waves, and the different things that were supposed to happen. But then whether you did it with like a preset computer or a large bank of synthesizers doing it live, that was that was up to you. And so that was 
a really different kind of a score for an electronic piece. Mm. Obviously, most people don't make their electroacoustic music that way, but the, it's like just an interesting example. Um, well, Alexander brings up the idea of publishing houses having a person yeah. whose job is to archive mm-hmm. electroacoustic music in this way so that there's some way to reproduce it in the future. And Nate, to me, that seems like a perfect way. Certainly, if you're writing a score, like I've got a piece that's for a DD5 digital delay pedal and an RC20 loop station, right? right? And I have instructions in the score that this is exactly how you do this piece with this equipment. But I could describe that in very uh, absolute terms, like technically what happens, mm-hmm. um, so that if someone wanted to emulate all of these effects using any other technology that will do it, they could based on a description not that's not filtered through the hardware pieces themselves, but it's just a technical description of what's actually happening. You know? Yeah, in, in Thea Musgrave's Narcissus is a good example of uh, the composer doing a good job with that. They lay, or she lays out pretty technical <laughs> uh, description of what the delay times are the kind of kind of modulation that's supposed to happen. Fortunately, we've got good recordings of performances with the original hardware too, so we can go from that. Yeah. Um, but a lot of a lot of pieces uh, don't have that like or that like all the same information. And a couple, she uh, Alexandra okay. describes some that we don't have recordings of, or other ones that just the. The hardware is just like impossible to find, and it might be tricky to re- re- reproduce with other things. Yeah. It's an interesting project. Um, Miller Puckett, the from whence Max MSP gains its name, has been had been working on a project, the PD Repertory Project, for a, a long called. time. Yeah, and uh, yeah. he's got some Boulez, Stockhouse, and Philippe Monnery, uh different pieces that he had been working through with that. It seems like that. Uh, haven't heard too much about that in a while. <laughs> yeah. Been waiting for this Boulez patch to pop up for a long time, but it seems like it's still not up on the web. <laughs> How did I never well, put together that Miller S. Puckett was MSP? Right? How is that? <laughs> like, I, I knew those two concepts. Anyway, that, you just blew my mind, Nate. Um, no, that's great. I, like- I, I would like to see these kinds of the, the, the digital sides be open sourced and, and so that like the community of, of people like like... Puckett's uh, Pure Data Repertory project um, could be updated. One of the problems, and, and Alex mentions this in the piece, was opening up even something that was written for digital recreation in Max in a new version of Max didn't work, and she had to figure it out. And we we have the same problem with with digital score files, right? Uh, I mean, right. I I do my scores in Sibelius and. Currently, the future of Sibelius is is up in the air, thanks, Avid. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know what's going to happen if Sibelius 8 ever comes out, or maybe Avid just drops Sibelius support entirely at some point. Sibelius 7 is not going to work on any of my computers anymore. Right. Um, and and that's, a, that's, to me, a big problem. And, you know, you save them out as PDFs, and PDFs are, seem like they're going to be as close to forever as we can get. But, uh, you know... Who knows? Um, and it's a big problem. And then, you know, maybe this new Steinberg thing, and I switch to the Steinberg thing, and I've got all these old Sibelius scores, and it's a... I, I, uh, we, we still... Yeah, have, yeah no! <laughs> what do we... This is, a, this is a problem that we are going to solve, have to solve not just for interactive electronic works, but it's something we're going to have to solve for all forms of documentation yep. now and forward, right? Because I, I mean, I basically have put my printer in the closet i get it out once a quarter when i need to print something but everything else in my life i do digitally yeah. so that, well, i think that in itself presents an archiving problem sam well that to me suggests her last paragraph brings up the idea of um another argument she says another argument presented that addresses the sheer volume of creating creative work uh, that is being produced at the time. Should this music be preserved for continuing performance? In other words, I think she's addressing the idea of we feel sort of an obligation to build upon and keep developing what we consider to be a canon. But considering how much work there is out there and how accessible all of it is, I mean, I think we would have to agree that what the stuff that is canonized now is a product of accessibility and what was available 
and uh, and now stuff happens so fast, and there's so much stuff that's available. Is the process of canonizing stuff the same? Should we think about it in the same way? Should we think about preserving pieces in the same way, or are just the audio recordings in themselves enough? I, Do we have a responsibility to build a can, keep building a canon in that way? Honestly, the problem to me is getting not even getting to that foreverness of of archiving in that regard, but solving the problem just for me. Forget you, jackals. I just want to be able to get to my scores in ten years and twenty <laughs> years from now, right? Because yeah. uh, 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 technology is is changing the 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 span. We're on the the logarithm algorithm i don't know math but the the one that goes up faster um is <laughs> right that we have a, a faster turnover than we ever did before and right. to me just going back to something i wrote five years ago that's in a digital format is non-trivial to bring up and edit or or even just print out uh unless i've saved it in a pdf or something and who knows how long pdf is going to continue to be a thing right but yeah. with um with pdf you you can't edit i mean i guess you right. can't yeah, right. you can, i mean but, i could always re-engrave it yeah right so if, you know revisions are out of the question but you see back to the other question about um sort of archiving stuff i think it's i don't think it's an either or thing i think you need the original document or recording mm-hmm. or whether it's mort Sabotnik's early pieces or whatever or, or even the Harry Parch, I mean, taken into an al- analog realm, the early Harry Parch recordings of how things are supposed to sound, and with the later, you know, instruments, you know, if you want to rebuild, you have to sort of listen, and, and I mean, you have it very well documented in this book, but it's, I think, with the electronic stuff, back to that, I mean, it's, it seems like you need the, the audio, you know, reference, but then mm-hmm. you need the description about, okay, how many, you know, reverbs, you know, what's the depth, what's the, you know, whatever it might be, and then plus, you need the the software to to bring it into the you know, out of the legacy into the what's current. And I think it all works together. Yeah. We've all been through those frustrations. Though. I I agree with with uh, software. You know, it was the old Studio Vision, and then that switched to Digital Performer, and then into right. Logic or whatever it might be. Yeah, right. And also the notation thing is just crazy. They they need a standard, and they were working on that. Wasn't there a standard, a notation uh, standard electronic uh, language? People are working on that, and I don't know how far the people that I think they, they developed Score. That's that program that was a yeah. few years mm-hmm. back, mm-hmm. but I, I don't think that ever worked out because people got into their own programs, whether it was yeah. Sales or Finale. And I don't know if that common language ever developed where it'd be easy to translate into the next program. It's it's one of those things where somebody decides, oh yeah, what we need is a standard, and they make a new one, and then there's now instead of eight standards, there are nine standards, <laughs> and it's still right. a mess. Um, Daniel Spreadbury is a, is a guy to talk to about that kind of stuff. We had him on the show. And, yeah, oh. the new the former guy who former project developed. lead at, at Sibelius. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, luckily we still have MIDI, right? I mean, MIDI doesn't yeah. seem yeah. to want to go anywhere. So uh, that's we're lucky on that on that front. Well, yeah, and, and, for and, all and, its faults, that was a big success. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just the <laughs> just the lasting time. You know. Well, it's Matthew, fun. I like what you said that that. It, we have these recordings and in some regard the best thing to do is to listen to those and figure out what we have to do to get kind of close to that and, and in some regard that's what we've been doing for centuries with scores right we've got some kind of documentation that that is not the thing but it is uh you know our our guiding principles for creating this thing and as we shift to a m- things that are harder to write down the re- recording of the performance has become the primary document over the score in in especially in things like Harry Parch and and I think that's a great example because it's something that it's it's almost like resurrecting a dead language or something you're not exactly sure how the ancient greeks spoke ancient greek mm-hmm. um you just kind of have to make an educated guess and we thankfully have these recordings of what the parch instrument sounded like and we can kind of take his instructions and then also compare what our thing sounds like to what this recording sounds like and kind of tweak back and forth and i think that's we we like you said we have these multiple channels uh of of preservation going on simultaneously and we have to when studying these archives in 50 years we'll have to just take all of them in in different measures uh to figure out how to to recreate and preserve a thing i think it's time sam hold on 
Oh. Last week, we barely missed. Oh, we yes, this do... came out just, like, moments after we came down. Right, I literally found the story of Lou Reed's passing mm. right after we finished recording last Sunday. And uh, so, li- love him or hate him, uh, he's certainly an influential figure. And so, uh, rest in peace, Lou Reed. And there's a really, I'm going to post it in the show notes, a really beautiful um eulogy i mean you can read the times eulogy that it's like a, a breakdown in the history of his life the typical thing did anyone else know that he was married to laurie anderson i did this was news to me yeah i didn't know that <laughs> so anyway she wrote a really beautiful like 200 words or less um eulogy that was printed in their hometown paper and i'm gonna have a link to that as well so uh we lost a very influential uh figure in music and uh sorry we barely missed that last week so now it is time for the pick of the week. Thanks, Sam. It's a good one. <laughs> Our pick of the week is from the album that we were talking with Matthew about this morning, uh, and we we just said we're going with double concerto, right? Just to make sure, sure. I don't mess it up. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Matthew, you kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. Do you have anything you want to say before we uh, um, play a little bit of this to set set up this clip from the opening of the double concerto? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, well, the uh, the soloist is it's a double concerto. It's your usual double concerto, right? Baritone, saxophone, percussion, and orchestra, right? Right. Um, it's a, just like Vivaldi wrote. That's it. That's it. So, um, and it was it's it was written for Kenneth Kuhn, who's the uh, baritone saxophone player, saxophone player with the Rasher Saxophone Quartet, and Lisa Pegger, who's the percussionist who lives in Brooklyn, New York, uh, who's incredible. Both of them are just amazing. So. I worked with Ken a lot on the part and with Lisa, but with Ken, he, we went through different sounds from the instrument, and there's this sort of primal, if the lowest note of the baritone sax, if you work off the overtone series of that, uh, you, get, you get some really interesting stuff. It's, you know, the, the whole tube is closed, you know, and you can just, he did some really f- fantastic uh, subtle changes in that sound. So the piece sort of comes out of that. So that's sort of the er sound of the piece is, is this like multiphonics based on the overtone series. Uh, derived from the lowest note on the on the baritone sax, and uh, maybe I shouldn't say much more than that. Um, I do use you know my microtonal language is is comes in and out um, with the tuned piano in the orchestra and the instruments uh, asked to do all kinds of tuning related stuff. But uh, but anyway, I probably won't say much more than that. It's it's a large piece. It's uh, you know five movements. But I thought maybe the opening would be nice to hear. No, that's great. Uh, so this is an excerpt from Matthew Rosenblum's uh, Double Concerto from the new Beamop album, Mobius Loop. <laughs> So that was an excerpt from Double Concerto for Baritone Saxophone and Percussion by our guest today, Matthew Rosenblum, performed by Beamop on their new album, Mobius Loop. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Matthew. That was wonderful. Oh, you know what? I can't hear you because I forgot to turn the Skype back up again. <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying? I was thanking you as well oh. <laughs> for uh, having me on and, and playing that uh, excerpt. I appreciate it. Terrific. We, we, we talked about it a lot earlier at the, at the, at the beginning, so I don't, I don't know if we want to necessarily loop back on a lot of that stuff, no pun intended. Uh, but 
uh, it's 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 really I, I the the combination of of baritone saxophone and percussion is is more um, there 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 seems to be more similarities in there than I would have guessed one would <laughs> one would come away with at the opening. Uh-huh. Uh, that's, that's, uh, there's something that's, something about the uh, the um, uh, the multiphonic has the feel of this repeated beating that yeah. reminds me a lot of a, of a percussion roll. Right, right, sure. The, there's the I mean, it's a metallic sound, you know, yeah. uh, and uh, playing the break drum, you know, just roll on the break drum and and the cymbals and. So yeah, it's it's a very uh, I, I seem to gravitate towards metallic sort of sound worlds, but so there's a lot of metal percussion uh, that Lisa plays, and but she's a great drummer as well. She has a sort of uh, a rock and roll background, and she just really kicks 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 it out of the ballpark in that last movement. So which is mostly drums, but for a large part of it, yeah, it's interesting to hear you say that because uh, I was thinking about that a lot. It seems like there was actually a part where um, I heard, I think, a xylophone roll, and it really felt like it came out of the multiphonic sound that I was hearing, and mm-hmm. like in a way, it like elided together in a way that fooled me at first. Even it was very nice. Oh, thanks. Um, I love hearing uh, the lower single reed instruments do this kind of work too, because it's so much more powerful. You're talking about a bigger vibrating object, you know, so multiphonics are way more powerful and seem way more present yeah. than like on a soprano clarinet or something. Right, right. It was like contrabass. Yeah, uh, yeah the, you can do so much with those high harmonics on the, on the, on the low contrabass and with the baritone sax. And, yeah, but, um, and the, the technical developments in, in players over the past couple of decades means that you can, Anything that you would write for just about any saxophone, you can ask a contrabass clarinet player or a con- or a barry sax player to do, and they're going to be able to do it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there because we've been we've been we've been running long a lot lately, and we're running long again today. Uh, but Matthew, before we go, do you have anything coming up that you want to plug? Uh, well, maybe I'll just mention this, uh, this Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, uh, sort of they're calling it the Year of the Pittsburgh Composer. So they're featuring eight different uh, composers this year. Um, uh, maybe I'll just... Uh, so we've got a, a, a premiere coming up on February 7th in Pittsburgh with this piece called The Elements. Um, is, uh, five of us collaborated, my colleague Amy Williams, Patrick Burke, Reza Valley, and Bo Mi Zhang, who's actually one of our graduate students, um, we collaborated on this piece that'll be premiered February 7th through 9th in Pittsburgh. So I want to just sort of give some kudos to the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra for recognizing, you know, us folks that are in town. There are plenty more of us, and I hope this will continue so, so it'll rotate and that they'll feature a different set of composers next time because there's, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff going on in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, that's, that's great. And, and in addition, you should also pick up this album that you were just hearing part of. Uh, from BMOP. It's great. We'll have links to where you can find those things uh, in our show notes at soundnotion.tv slash SN. Thanks to everyone who was uh, watching or listening today. Thanks to everyone who was watching or listening live. We do stream this show every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So if you would like to join us live, you can do that in chat and you can share your, your thoughts and ask questions there. Uh, and we, we try to keep an eye on the chat room while we're doing the show. If you have any stories that you think would be great for the show, you can let us know in there. You can let us know by leaving us a comment on the site. Um, you can also connect with us on all the social media machines, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, if you want to suggest a story f- for us, you can tweet it to us with hashtag SN Weekly, and we always check that out while we're getting ready for the, the show each week. Um, you can also subscribe to this show and all our shows at soundnotion.tv in the iTunes store and get them all downloaded automatically to your device uh, and, and never miss an episode. Collect them all. Uh, if you'd like to support us, you can do so using the uh, Amazon affiliate link search box on the right side of our site so when you're doing your christmas shopping on amazon like at least i know i do all of my christmas shopping on amazon because i'm not going to the store um you can if you just do your search through our little box on our site then uh it won't look any different to you it won't cost you anything more but we'll get a tiny little commission that helps us out a lot uh sound notions introduction includes music by patrick gulo and video by tyler lab thanks again for watching and we will see you back next week be mob